Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering pediatric neurological disorders. Now, before we get started, as always, I'm going to ask you to please support me and support this channel by liking this video, giving that a uh, thumbs up, pressing that red notification button so you'll be notified every time a new video is released. And don't forget, I have audio lessons available on my website. And besides the audio lessons, you can also book for an NCLEX NGN review session on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Also, don't forget, you can also share my content on your social media uh, profile or with a friend or colleague that's struggling in the program, or maybe they're even thinking about entering the nursing program. That would really help my channel grow, and that would be a way to support my channel. So thank you so much in advance. Now, before we get started, guys, I want to start off with a prayer. If you're not into that, no problem. Just fast forward. And if you are, close your eyes by your head. Ah, oh, Father God, Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you for another opportunity given to us to go over information, Lord. Father God, I pray over every viewer right now, Lord, I ask that you please put them in a state of peace and allow them to be able to focus for the short time that they're watching the video or they're listening to the video, Father God. Lord, I ask that during this time, you move any distractions from them and help them to focus on the items that are being presented. Lord, I pray for those students who have test anxiety. I pray for those students who have a barrier in their way that they've been trying to pass their boards for so long and they haven't been able to, or maybe they're in school and they're just really struggling, Father God. Lord, I ask that you please help remove those obstacles and those barriers from their way, Father God. Lord, I ask that you please help them to be able to absorb this material and understand this material and be able to think critically through this material. So when they see these same principles again, they can apply it accordingly and get better grades. Father God, I ask that you please help uh, uh, the viewers and the listening, the listeners Father God, to succeed and let them not be selfish when they get that license. Let them be a blessing to others. Lord, thank you for this opportunity that you've given me to be able to teach this uh, information in a way that seems to resound with the students. And Lord, I ask that you just speak through me and allow me to explain in a way that they can understand. Thank you for all you've done and all you continue to do in Jesus Christ. We pray. Amen. All right, guys, let's get started. First question. A 10-month-old child is seen in the Well Baby Clinic. Which assessment finding by the nurse indicates a need for further neurological evaluation? One, inability to crawl. Two, speaking only two to four words. Three, inability to sit without support. Or four, presence of crude pincer grasp. What do you guys say? And guys, the correct answer is three, inability to sit uh, up without support because we should be seeing this around seven to nine months and the question says that this child is now 10 months so we're going to question okay what's going on further evaluations needed now let's look at our other answer choices one inability to crawl we see this around nine to 12 months this infant is only 10 months so they still have time to reach that milestone two inability excuse me two speaking only two to four uh, uh, words that is normal for the 10 month old to only be able to say one or two words such as mama, dada. Choice four, the presence of a crude pincer grasp. We don't see this until around 11 months old. This child is um, only 10 months, so this child still has time. But sitting up without support, again, we see that around seven to nine months, so this is the one that's gonna need further evaluation. What should the nurse do to protect a child from injury during a seizure? One, restrain the child's arms and legs. Two, place a tongue blade in the child's mouth. Three, place a pillow under the child's head. Or four, provide a waterproof pad for the bed. What do you guys think? And the correct answer is three, place a pillow under the child's head. Why? Because patients having a seizure, right? They're moving like this and we don't want them to hit the back of their head and to injure their head. So if it's possible to place a pillow under that child's head to kind of soften that blow, that's what you want to do to help protect the child. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, restrain the child's arms and legs. Do you ever restrain a patient during a seizure? Absolutely not. What you're going to do as soon as the patient has a seizure, you're going to look at the clock to see what time it started because you have to tell the healthcare provider approximately how long the patient had the seizure for. You want to close the curtain to give that patient privacy. You want to move everything out of the way so they don't injure themselves during the seizure. You want to make sure you move any restrictive clothing so the patient's not harmed during the seizure. But you're never going to restrain the seizure and you're definitely not going to put anything in the patient's mouth. So the one about the tongue blade, we know that's wrong as well. You want to protect the patient. So the correct answer is going to be 
Number three, for putting a waterproof pad for um, the bed. Well, the thing is when a patient has a seizure, they do not have control over their bodily functions. So putting up um, a waterproof pad will protect the mattress, but that's not going to protect the patient, but that pillow under the head absolutely uh, can help protect the patient. One more thing I want to mention, if the patient's having a seizure, if it's possible to put them on their left side during the seizure, you want to do that because that will uh, decrease their um, chances of them aspirating and just helping them breathe better, breathe better. You may not always be able to do so, but if you can, you also want to place them on the left side. So guys, number three is the correct answer choice the nurse is teaching parents of a child who has cerebral palsy to feed the child what position is best recommended one normal eating position and provides us uh, excuse me number uh, number one normal eating position provides stabilization of the jaw two semi reclining position three upright while using nasogastric or gastro gastro gastrostomy tube, or four, hyperextension of the neck. I hate how this was worded. But the correct answer is one, normal eating position. I hate the word normal, but whatever. Normal eating position and provide stabilization of the jaw. So what is a normal eating position? The patient's eating up. Okay, so ha eating up, sitting up, the patient's sitting up. So you want to have them uh, sit up and you want to provide stabilization of the jaw because that's going to help promote swallowing while preventing aspiration. So that is uh, the best position. Now, choice number two, semi-reclining position. The reason you don't want to do semi-reclining is you can promote reflux of the food and hydrochloric acid that's in the patient's stomach and you really don't want that. Choice three, um, sitting upright, okay, that part's correct, while using NG or gastrostomy tube. Um, the patient with cerebral palsy, they don't need an NG tube or gastrostomy tube unless there's something else going on with their GI tract, but they don't normally need either of those, so that's wrong. And then choice four, hyperextension of the neck. You know what hyperextension means? That means doing this all the way back here. So if you have hyperextension of the neck, how's that patient supposed to swallow? That's gonna interfere with swallowing. So the correct answer, guys, is choice number one. A one-year-old child is admitted to the pediatric unit with a diagnosis of bacterial men meningitis. Which room should the nurse assign to this child? One, a room with a two-year-old who has surgery for hernia repair. Two, a room with a one-year-old who has pneumonia. Three, a room with a two-year-old who has cerebral palsy. Or four, a private room with no roommates. And the correct answer is for a private room with no roommates. And guys, this goes across the board. If the patient has an infectious process, you want to put them in a room by themselves. Now, let's say you don't have that choice to put them in the room by themselves. The best, second best option is to put them in a room with someone else that also has an infectious process of the same nature. But preferably, you want them to be in a room by themselves. So that's number one. Number two, let's talk about meningitis for a minute. So... That patient that has meningitis, you know, they're going to present with these signs and symptoms. They're going to have fever. They're going to have photophobia. They're going to have nuchal rigidity. By the way, nuchal rigidity, that is a classic sign of um, meningitis, right? And it's usually going to be a younger patient, like, you know, late adolescence, early, early adults. Anyway, patient comes in with these symptoms and you suspect meningitis, but you don't know yet. You haven't been able to confirm. It doesn't matter. The minute you suspect a patient has meningitis, they're going to go in isolation immediately. Patient's going to be on high dose um, antibiotics. They're going to get, um, what's it called when you draw the blood? Culture, when you're gonna get culture samples. So the first thing you're gonna do is put the patient in isolation. Immediately, you're gonna get the samples to culture and you're gonna put the patient on high steroid antibiotics. And that's just with the suspicion of meningitis because remember those cultures take a couple days before you get the results. And time is of the essence. We don't have time to wait for the culture to grow to confirm that the patient has meningitis. So this is very important for you guys to know. All right guys, moving on. The nurse is caring for an uh, infant who's admitted with bacterial meningitis. What is the first priority when providing nursing care for this child? One, administer ordered antibiotics as soon as possible. Two, keep the room quiet. Three, explain all procedures to the parents. Or four, begin low flow oxygen via mask. So out of these choices, what is going to be the most important priority? 
And the correct answer is antibiotics. This is a very serious and potentially deadly disease and we need to treat this patient as soon as possible. So everything else can wait. We're gonna give that patient antibiotics. Keeping the room quiet and dim, absolutely that is something you wanna do because remember meningitis affects the CNS, right? So we're trying to decrease stimulation, not increase. So yes, we're gonna dim the lights. Yes, we're gonna give them a sterile, um, um, a quiet, serene environment, but the antibiotics takes place place. We're going to explain the procedures and we may give the patient oxygen if they're having some type of respiratory issue. So depending on whatever comorbidities the patient has, they may get oxygen. But our first priority, guys, is always going to be what is going to keep your patient alive. Whenever you're being asked about priority, always think to yourself, okay, what's going to keep my patient alive fastest for the longest? And that's what's going to be your priority. Or on the other flip side, what can kill my patient the fastest, whatever can kill your patient the fastest, that's what you're gonna address first. A newborn's been, um, a newborn has myelomeningocele. What is the most important nursing action prior to surgery? One, turn the infant every two hours. Two, encourage holding and cuddling the parents, by the parents. Three, apply sterile, moist, non-adherent dressings over the lesion. Four, administer pain medication every three to four hours. Okay guys, and the correct answer is three. You want to apply sterile, moist, non-adherent dressing over the lesions. Um, think about it guys, if this lesion becomes dry, it becomes crap. Guess what can happen? Bacteria. Bacteria will set in and this is, you know, this can turn into a septic infection for the patient. So until it can be corrected via surgery, you're going to make sure that you keep a, a sterile, moist, non-adhering dressing because you want to keep it nice and moist. You don't want it to dry out. You don't want it to crack. Now look at the other choices. One, turning the patient every two hours. How are you going to turn them every two hours when they have to stay prone? Look at the diagnosis. They have a myelomeningocele. They can't be on their back. So how are you going to turn them every two hours? We have to keep pressure off of the site. So that's false. Two, encourage holding and cuddling by the parents. Unfortunately, at this time, no, you cannot because that patient has to be prone. We cannot have any pressure or even any irritation of that site. So the parents are encouraged to, you know, stroke the patient's face or, you know, touch them and, you know, show affection in that way and talk to the infant, but no cuddling or holding. We cannot take any chances. Choice four, administer pain medication every three to four hours. With myelomeningocele, there usually isn't any pain, so there's no, it's not necessary to give pain medication every three to four hours. Which assessment regularly performed on newborns and infants will do most to help with early identification of infants who might have hydrocephalus? One, head circumference. Two, weight measurement. Three, length measurement. Or four, presence of reflexes. And guys, the correct answer is one, head circumference. If you don't know what hydrocephalus, hydrocephalus looks like, do a simple Google search and you will never forget that it's going to be head circumference. They've got all this fluid in their head. So the, that's the number one tool for early identification of hydrocephalus. And what happens is their um, head, the circumference, is going to be measured at birth and also every uh, baby will visit. So if we're seeing a dramatic increase, the patient, the patient can be evaluated further. Two, three, and four, they're all wrong. How should the nurse position a four month old infant who has hydrocephalus? Sideline, sideline sitting up in an infancy, alternating prone and supine, or left Sims position? What do you say? We're talking about hydrocephalus. And guys, the correct answer to sitting up in an infant seat. Why? This helps um, drainage for all of that fluid that's in their head to decrease intracranial pressure. Now, let's look at the other choices. One, have them lying down, sideline, and you guys know about intracranial pressure. So no, have them lying down, sideline, that's going to increase the intracranial pressure. 
Three, alternating prone and supine. That's going to increase intracranial pressure. And left sense position, same thing. Lying down, that's going to increase intracranial pressure. So the correct answer is number two. That's going to help to promote drainage and decrease intracranial pressure. Because remember, that patient with hydrocephalus, they're at increased risk for increased intracranial pressure. The parents of a child who had otitis media asked the nurse why the doctor told them to give the child acetaminophen instead of aspirin. What should the nurse include when answering? One, acetaminophen is more effective against ear pain than aspirin. Two, acetaminophen is better at reducing temperature than aspirin. Three, aspirin can cause gastritis in children. Or four, aspirin is thought to cause Ray's syndrome, a serious, a very serious disease. What do you guys say? And the correct answer is four. Aspirin is thought to cause a Ray syndrome or Rye syndrome, a very serious disease. And that's why we do not give aspirin to children, especially, especially if they have a viral illness, because it's thought that you give aspirin to a child with a viral illness, it severely increases their risk for Ray syndrome. So that is the correct answer. Let's look at the wrong answer choices before I move on. One, acetaminophen is more effective against ear pain than aspirin. No, it's not. It's almost as effective, actually. Um, choice two, acetaminophen is better at reducing temperature than aspirin. It's not better than aspirin. We just can't give aspirin to children. Choice three, aspirin can cause gastritis in children. True, but aspirin can cause gastritis in adults as well. It can cause gastritis in everyone. The reason that we do not give it to children, again, is because we don't want the chance of that patient getting Ray syndrome, which can kill them. The parents of a child who is newly diagnosed with Tay-Sachs disease ask the nurse, if we have more children, could they be affected? Which information should be included when responding to the parents? One, boys are more likely to inherit the disease than girls. Two, Tay-Sachs is not inherited, so there's little chance other than children will have it, that other children have it. Three, there's a one in four chance that each pregnancy will result in a child with the disease. Or four, 50% of the girls will have the disease. What do you guys think? All right, so the correct answer, guys, is three, there is one in four chance that each pregnancy in each pregnancy will result in the child having the disease. So Tay-Sachs, just like sickle cell, is an autosomal recessive disorder. So if two parents have the trait, there is a 25% chance, one in four, that um, with each pregnancy that the child can actually have the disease. If both parents have the trait, there's a 25% that the offspring can have the disease or the disorder. So number three is the correct answer. When planning care for an infant who has Tay-Sachs disease, the nurse knows that the care is aimed at which of the following? One, providing supportive care until the child dies. Two, preventing spread of the disease to others. Three, curing the underlying problem so the child will grow normally. Or four, providing for maximal, maximum development of the child. What do you guys say? And guys, the correct answer is one, providing supportive care until the child dies. Know that it says, um, note that it says until. There's no cure that child will die. So the best thing you can do is provide supportive care. Let's look at the wrong answer choices. Two, prevent uh, spread of the disease to others. It's not infectious. Tay-Sachs is not an infectious process. Three, curing the underlying problem. There's no cure. And four, providing for maximum development of the child. Um, there is no maximum development of the child. Um, everything starts to break down tissues, muscles, everything. So um, that is false. Number one is the correct answer. An infant is born with a meningomyelocele. How should the nurse position the infant before surgery? One, prone with the pillow under the legs. Two, supine with the head elevated. Three, sideline with the pillow at the back. Or four, semi followers with small pillow. And guys, you all should get this correct because I accidentally gave you the answer a couple questions ago. What do you think the answer is? Okay. So with that meningo Milo meningocele, the patient has to be placed prone on their stomach. We don't want 
anything to disrupt or irritate that sac until the patient can go into surgery and get that corrected. So the correct answer is gonna be choice number one. Look at choice number two, supine with head elevated on their back, that's putting pressure on the site. Two, side lying with a pillow on the back, that's putting pressure on the site. Three, semi-followers with a small pillow, that's still putting pressure on the site. The patient has to be in prone position for this particular diagnosis. The parents of a two-year-old child who ha has meningitis ask the nurse why the lights are dim in the child's room, even in the daytime. What information should the nurse include in the answer? One, rest is essential and a dimly lit room, room promotes sleep. Two, the child is sensitive to light and may develop seizures. Three, the IV medications are sensitive to light. Four, light could cause severe damage to the eyes and possible blindness. What do you guys say? And the correct answer is two, the child is sensitive to light and may develop seizures. Remember those signs and symptoms of meningitis, the fever, the nuchal rigidity, photophobia, they have sensitivity to light and we don't want, um, especially with this brain disease, for the patient to start having seizures, okay? We want to decrease stimulation, not increase stimulation of the CNS as in seizures. Number um, two is the correct answer choice. A six-year-old child is brought to the doctor's office with crust on the eyes and very red conjunctiva. The doctor prescribes antibiotic eye drops. The child's mother asks the nurse if the child can go back to school this afternoon. How should the nurse respond? One, teach a child not to touch his eyes and take him back to school. Two, he should stay out of school today but can go back tomorrow. Three, he should stay out of school for a week because it usually takes a week for the condition to clear. Or four, this, contagious, this condition is very contagious. The child should stay out of school for the next two days. What do you guys say? And guys, the correct answer is four. This, condi this condition is very contagious. The child should stay out of school for the next two days. Here's the thing. With um, conjunctivitis, this is what's known as pink eye. The child has to be on antibiotics for a full 24 hours before they can go back to school. So look at this question. They just came in today, which means, okay, the antibiotics are going to be ordered today. And best case scenario, the patient starts taking this antibiotic today, but tomorrow's not going to be a full 24 hours. They can't go to school in the morning. They have to be on antibiotics for a full 24 hours before they're allowed to go back to school because being on antibiotics for a full 24 hours, they won't be contagious and that's why they're allowed to go back. The nurse is administering eye drops to a child who has conjunctivitis. Where should the eye drops be placed? On the pupil, in the conjunctive in the conjunctival sac, by the inner canthus, or on the sclera? What do you guys say? And guys, the correct answer is two, in the conjunctival uh, uh, sac. And what happens is you're going to place it in the conjunctival sac, pull down right here, that pink area down there. You're going to put the medication there, but you're also very gently, you're going to put pressure on the inner canthus because you don't want that medication going into, you know, the tear ducts and now this patient's got a runny nose. Okay. And we are down to our last question, guys. The nurse is caring for a five-month-old infant who had a craniotomy following a head injury. Which observation, which observation the LPN or LVN makes should be reported to the charge nurse? Respirations of 38, difficulty arousing the baby from a nap, pulse rate of 120, or the baby cannot sit up by herself. What do you guys think? And the correct answer is two, difficulty arousing the baby from a nap. Well, that's considered what? Changing level of consciousness. Guys, changing level of consciousness, this is always a red flag. We're unable to arouse the baby, so the baby's what? Lethargic? That is a red flag. That has to be reported immediately. Look, this is a five-month-old child. Respirations of 38, pulse of 120, not being able to sit up by themselves. This is normal for a five-month-old child, but not being able to be aroused from a nap, that is a red flag that has to be reported immediately. All right, guys, and that is it for um, disorders of 
the CNS for the pediatric patient. Please, in the comment section, let me know what you thought about this video. And don't forget, guys, on my other social media platforms such as TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, almost daily, you can go on there and find me covering a variety of different types of nursing um, content. It's just very quick and passive learning to supplement your learning that you're having right now. And don't forget, on my website, you can check out my audio lessons and also book your next NCLEX review. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for watching, guys. And you guys, Catch me on the next video.